one gain from spending time in a computer-generated world? And the short answer for me is that gaming tells us there is something about the way we uh, perceive reality that is not uh, necessarily the whole truth. Um, my main argument is that computer games are good for pointing our attention towards some basic philosophical questions. Um, at least they have the capability to do so. And such questions are related to the intellectual foundation of archaeology as a subject itself. So I want to investigate how we may theoretically deal with a past that was very real, but only intellectually available to us through concepts or as materialized through uh, conceptualized artifacts or experiences. So I will dive into a little rabbit hole and speculate freely and stretch this computer game analogy to the breaking point. <laughs> so what makes The Elder Scrolls and similar RPGs special? They offer the emergence into a complete world where years of your life can be spent. <laughs> the game generates, on a certain level, feelings, a sense of belonging, um, and motivation tied to the character and its traits and skill set. And in Arena, one could explore the entire continent of Tamriel as the graphics were spontaneously created. But what lies behind this audiovisual experience? Um, the fact of a reality behind the constructed graphic interface struck me when playing both Arena and later, especially Skyrim. Uh, because the PC game experience alludes to the notion that reality itself is provisional and illusory, but still real. So the world of Tamriel does exist on a certain level, in the same way as a world created in a book or a dream exists. But I will argue that the game offers a very compelling model or illusion of the human experience. And a big part of the game um, is the development of the avatar, the in-game identity. And this identity is a core motivator, a simple version of the human character and ego. Uh, and the group or race you choose to belong to decides many of your character traits. So I will later discuss a little bit how the avatar relates to some basic philosophical questions on agency and identity. So, <laughs> the world of Arena is obviously an illusion on the computer screen, but by definition, an illusion is not something that is non-existent. It is something that exists on a certain level, but not what it appears to be. And this notion resonates with non-dual uh, non thinking and also assemblage theory that has been fashionable in archaeology for the last 10 years or so. And fundamentally, this is the idea that the unity of existence appears as fragmented categories. And according to both quantum physics and non-dualism in philosophy, things appear to exist as discrete objects and this is somewhat akin to what plays out on the screen in a piece again. So, with the honest naivety of Philomena Kunk, I will explore some fundamental questions and reflect on a few theoretical insights I perhaps had from extensive amounts of gaming. Such as, what is the nature of experience? What is matter? And how can one understand the question of human agency and identity? Uh, Carlo Rovelli, an Italian physicist, has pointed out that the best way of thinking of the world is in manner of change, not permanence, not being but becoming. And the difference between things and historical events is that things uh, persist in time, while events have a more limited duration. And on closer inspection, uh, even the things that are most thing-like, like stone artifacts or stones, are nothing more than very long events. And the smallest part of an atom is only a postulate, something that evades direct observation. So matter in itself is only events that for a while are monotonous, according to him. Uh, 
In the book, The Case Against Reality, American cognitive psychologist Donald Hoffman argues that the world is nothing like what we see through our eyes. Um, our perceptions are not the window into reality, he says, but instead interfaces constructed by natural selection. So the objects we see around us are more like icons on our computers. So while shaped like graphics on the screen, the computer files themselves are of course made as of series of ones and zeros that are too complex for most of us to understand. But in a similar way, evolution has shaped our perception into simplistic illusions that help us navigate the more mysterious world that is around us. So, with reference to Hoffman, one could say that the gamer is to the game what consciousness is to the apparent world. And uh, this is not to say that there is no such thing as real reality um, or an argument for such a state, but that rather that our cognition or uh, conceptualization uh, of it can be misleading. But the, the mystery is that there is no biological or physical basis yet found for consciousness itself. Science does not know who the knower of science is. So one can take this notion one level up from gaming and extrapolate from the non-dual idea that the human agent is not fully identical with its apparent separate avatar, which is the individual human body mind. And what does this mean? Uh, reality is real, but not what it seems. Uh, the material world is only the way one ineffable whole appears to itself when viewed through the emotional, intellectual and um, sensual conscious apparatus of a temporarily finite human mind. And I think a PC game is a good way of approaching this confusing notion. So, the common sense based uh, paradigm of the past served archaeology very well for a long time, um, enabling us to do what we wanted to do with the past, whether it was constructing national identities in the 19th century, creating advanced typologies, or contemporary narratives of cultural heritage. Mm. But a paradigm crisis occurs when neither the materialist nor the idealist paradigms are capable of answering all research questions. The dualistic model, the so-called Cartesian paradigm, can no longer accommodate the expanding knowledge of material, um, physical or, or theoretical nature. And without neither matter or consciousness as secure points of departure, the dualistic or Cartesian model is weakened. So how to deal with Reality. Uh, following this constructed line of thought, uh, the human mind can be said to function somewhat like a virtual reality headset. Uh, the virtual reality that is thoughts, feelings and sensation. And it creates the time and space dimensions of the Newtonian physics that constitute our perception of reality. And that is our human game mode, our sense of collective identity or character, then is derived from believing in the immediate appearance of our common sense based dualistic notion of the world. So the reaction to uh, dualistic thought, non-dualism, entered archaeology through the idea of uh, entanglement uh, as well as assemblage theory. And the notion of entanglement was primarily derived from Heidegger, who in turn borrowed extensively, extensively from Eastern philosophy and especially perhaps Zen Buddhism. Uh, archaeological assemblage thinking was derived from the French philosophers Deleuze and uh, Guattari, primarily who drew heavily on uh, both Bergson and Spinoza. And both of these old philosophers attempted to overcome the epistemological dualism inherent in both uh, idealism and materialism. 
So um, the implications of a new ontology as uh, presented through archaeological assemblage theory raises the question, who is the experiencer and agent? And according to Jane Bennett and Manuel Berlanda, this uh, regards not only the past agent, but also the researcher herself constructing and assembling a model of the past. So, assemblage theory is not oriented on the grid of dualistic subject-object object relationship. The assemblage modality of thinking implies that human beings are also objects in the affective constellations that uh, are the assemblages. But as a middle philosophical middle way perspective, assemblage theory has the possibility to bridge the apparent intellectual gap uh, between the Western core philosophies of materialism and idealism. And it reflects the notion of continual change in modern physics as a, a humanistic theory of action. And uh, the relationship between classical common sense archaeology and non-dual thinking um, an assemblage theory is a bit like the user or gaming interface versus actual programming and creating the gaming experience. Uh, but in the same way that quantum physics does not necessarily immediately influence the physics necessary to understand the apparent world, which is uh, still sufficiently explained by, by mechanical Newtonian physics, the quantum or proposed quantum field of archaeology does not immediately influence our mechanical common sense perception of the human life world and its past. So, the historian Hayden White analyzed history writing as, as narrative constructions. And in the same manner, certain forms of archaeology can be understood as fantasy literature. And an obvious example is the direct 19th century application of archaeology and history in social identity construction, uh, which for the most part is, is, is long gone in, in Western Europe as an active ideology, at least within archaeology as a professional field. But even a modest social analysis of uh, settle settlement patterns can never be more than a narrative connecting fragmented and misrepresented sources. And indirectly, the use of Historical narratives lies at the foundation of all discourses concerning existing perceptions of collective identities uh, built on the past. Broad examples are identification with gender, religion, Aboriginal groups, or national identities, uh, which are all often built on a perceived relationship with the past that directly constitutes uh, a present worldview and a sense of identity and privilege or lack of privilege. So, of course, neither perceptions nor conceptions can fully grasp the social reality of human life. Any intellectual system is designed to divide things up, simplify, abstract, and categorize the world in static models. But in one way, archaeologists are like creators of computer games. Um, the ones who produce archaeology must know the basic nature and quality of the programming language, so to speak. Uh, that is how reality and the conceptualized past is fundamentally constructed. And the new non-dual approach reveals that, it, that there is no such thing as actual historical objects or structures or valid historical individual or collective identity. Such construct, uh, constructions are only operative and provisional categories uh, to meet a certain cause or a research question. Mm. As such, they are only fleeting concessions to uh, the dualistic mind, a part of our human operative system. And assemblage thinking shows that no such idea have a, have a solid core. And especially because assemblage theory contributes to the understanding of um, extreme multicausality uh, that weakens the notion of history and archaeology as explaining causal processes through time. So, last slide. Um, Non-dualism is, of course, an imperfect approach, but perhaps better than the conventional model because it is honest 
with regards to the limit of human investigation. And the idea of non-dualism and uh, offsprings like assemblage theory and entanglement thinking has a revolutionary core, at least if taken far enough. And the recent developments in theoretical archaeology spurs our understanding of agency and matter to a deeper level. And this effectively removes uh, the science of the past from any modern ideological projects, such as uh, construction of individual or group identity. There is no such thing as cultural heritage, one can argue, because there is no one to inherit it. So I, I assume the non-dual approach will probably fade soon, as the postmodern uh, theories also did in the 90s. But I think uh, the seeds for revolution in the humanities has been sown, and it will be hard to completely, re completely return to old uh, epistemologies in the future. Yeah, thank you.